Remember who was president during the disastrous Iran hostage crisis? Jimmy Carter, the man who's built houses for the homeless, negotiated with North Korea, and now has faced down the Haitian leaders. Has Jimmy Carter changed, or have we? An Eye on America report, plus Dan Rather with the latest from Haiti, tomorrow on the CBS Evening News. I'm Paula Zahn in New York tonight. In a Los Angeles courtroom today, new arguments over the evidence in the O.J. Simpson case. This time, the issue was whether the prosecution has enough evidence to try Simpson for the murders of his ex-wife, Nicole, and Ronald Goldman. As correspondent Bill Whitaker reports, it didn't take the judge long to make up his mind. With jury selection just a week away, defense attorneys tried once again to have the case against O.J. Simpson dismissed. But Judge Lanzito ruled there is enough evidence for the double murder trial of the former football great to proceed. The crime involved here was that of murder and the motion pursuant to 995 is denied. Simpson's team tried to convince the judge that police had gathered evidence improperly, that they had jumped over the wall to Simpson's estate because of a tiny red smudge on the door of Simpson's Bronco. Police said they assumed the smudge was human blood. Defense attorney said police didn't know what it was and therefore entered Simpson's property illegally. Prosecutor Marsha Clark fired back. Whose blood would you expect to find on the door handle of a car? A giraffe? A dog? You expect to find a, a person. People drive cars. But the main defense argument was that prosecutors simply don't have enough evidence to prove their case. Defense attorney Robert Shapiro said with such a bloody crime scene, there's no evidence of blood on O.J. Simpson. No bloody clothing. No bloody shoes. No murder weapon. The only link those That's bloody gloves, the one found at the crime scene, the other behind Simpson's house. A coincidence Shapiro called impossible to believe. Somebody who was careful enough to get rid of all of those items of evidence would nonetheless leave one glove at the murder scene and deliberately bring home and leave on his own property a glove that could later be discovered in plain view by anyone who was walking on the property. The fact that a defendant makes mistakes Leaving evidence behind that allows the police to apprehend him is not the surprise. But if mistakes are not made, criminals are not apprehended. And that is the truth of the matter. Judge Ito agreed with prosecutors. With the trial going forward, defense attorney Johnny Cochran, in an interview with Connie Chung for Eye to Eye, said selecting an impartial jury untainted by the pretrial publicity is the next major hurdle. My biggest concern in the eve of trial is can we find those kind of those 12 kinds of jurors in Los Angeles County and still has an open mind, an honest open mind. Judge Ito will decide later whether to sequester the jury, something prosecutors want and defense attorneys vehemently oppose. This afternoon, prosecutors revealed they have subpoenaed Simpson's personal secretary to ask her why she shredded papers about domestic violence found in Simpson's office. Judge Ito sighed, just when I thought there were no more surprises, and said he'd take this issue up on Wednesday. Bill Whitaker, CBS News, Los Angeles. By the way, you can see more of Connie Chung's interview with attorney Johnny Cochran on Eye to Eye this Thursday night at 9, 8 central time right here on CBS. In other news, medical examiners did an autopsy today on the body of Vetus Garolitis, the former tennis star. But they say more tests will be needed to determine a cause of death. Garolitis died over the weekend at a friend's home in Southampton, New York. Police found no sign of foul play or drugs. Garolitis, who was 40, was once among the top-ranked tennis players in the world. More recently, he did commentary for the U.S. Open here on CBS. News about the U.S. economy today includes a dramatic comeback by America's high-tech industries. A new study says the U.S. has regained world leadership in many important technologies. And the study says America remains second to none in the field of information technology. Mixed day on Wall Street today. More losers than gainers. But the blue chips managed a small advance. They left on a mission to Haiti. 48 hours went with them. We'll show you what really happened inside the crisis. Dan Rather reports on an all-new 48 hours, Wednesday. Back now live in the Haitian capital of Port-au-Prince. Haiti's exiled President Aristide had no comment today on the U.S. deal with military leaders. Aristide is not mentioned in the agreement. 
there is no mention in the agreement of when he will return. So many of his supporters criticize it. American Aristide supporter Randall Robinson said the agreement could send Aristide back here to Haiti in personal danger from his enemies. As correspondent Jim Stewart now reports, President Aristide inspires strong feelings in his friends and his enemies. To his affectionate followers, he is known in Creole as Titi, or Little Aristide. To his many critics, Jean Bertrand Aristide is known as a moody, unpredictable leader who once urged his followers to burn opponents alive. William Gray, President Clinton's current Haiti advisor, says Aristide has pledged to forgive his enemies when he returns. Well, I don't believe uh, that uh, President Aristide uh, will go back in a sense of vengeance and retribution. But Lawrence Pizzullo, President Clinton's former Haiti advisor, isn't so sure. He hasn't shown a great disposition, I must say. Uh, and every time the issue comes up, uh, he, he, he backs away from it and blames people. Jean Bertrand Aristide grew up in a Haiti ruled by Papa Doc Duvalier and his son Baby Doc. As a young priest in the poor neighborhoods, he survived three assassination attempts and was once censured by his own order for preaching class warfare before a landslide victory in Haiti's only free election four years ago. When the people vote overwhelmingly, nearly 70%, that's democracy. It's the same here in America, and America should stand for the same thing. But in three years of exile, Aristide received backing from the Washington power structure, but attracted little sympathy from the American public. He surrounded himself with advisors whom critics felt were anti-American. We can secure the ground, we can prevent violence, we can do all other things, but we can't reconcile politically. That Aristide has to do Aristide has already pledged to step down from the presidency in a year, but it will be a crucial year for consensus building in Haiti. And for a man who speaks eight languages, his critics say, this is one message he has yet to master. Jim Stewart, CBS News, Washington. All a further indication of just how complex this situation is. Harry Smith and Paula Zahn will have more for you on CBS This Morning, tomorrow morning. Stay tuned to this CBS station for any developments as they occur. With Paula's on, Dan Rather reporting from Haiti. Good night.